Good afternoon, and welcome to the fifth installment of the COVID Ethics Series, Pregnancy and COVID-19, Keeping Mothers and Babies Well. My name is Brian Pilkington, and I teach ethics at Seton Hall University's School of Health and Medical Sciences, College of Nursing, and the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, uh, and also in the Department of Philosophy. For those joining us for the first time, this series was created to address ethics questions that have arisen or intensified due to COVID-19. In collaboration with IHS Student Life and coordinators in the medical school, we've addressed the balancing of safety and duties to care, when and how to reopen the country, how to exercise ethically, and best practices during the time of COVID. I'm grateful to our panelists from last week, all of them students from Seton Hall's IHS campus, for sharing their research, advocacy, activism, and experiences of frontline care. It has been reassuring to receive feedback from those listening to our program from across the nation. And I'm grateful for your comments and your suggestions. Today, we make good on a number of requests we've received over the past month to discuss ethical issues associated with pregnancy, labor, and delivery in the time of COVID. Whether firsthand from uh, a pregnant loved one or simply through the news, we learned of visitor restrictions, varying PPE guidelines for labor and de delivery, nurses, physicians, and other healthcare professionals, and concerns of newborns and mothers in proximity to patients with COVID. Stories of mothers delivering babies while in a coma have claimed national attention. Just this morning, the Washington Post reported the first death of an incarcerated mother weeks after an emergency C-section. Again, I ask you to mute your mics and your videos and join me as we learn from our panel of experts from across the nation. Please send us comments if you have comments or questions through the chat feature or tweet questions to us on our Twitter handle, which is at SHU Bioethics, at S-H-U-B-I-O-E-T-H-I-C-S. That's at SHU Bioethics. We'll come to our question and answer session at the end of the um, session today, but please feel free to submit questions while, uh, while the presentations are going on. One of our coordinators or I uh, will address those questions. Our plan for today uh, is to talk to five experts on our panel. Uh, we have Catherine Hahn, uh, who is a medical student um, in the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, currently doing research on maternal fetal health. Uh, we have Judith Lothian, uh, an esteemed professor of nursing at Seton Hall, who specializes in labor support, breastfeeding, and place of birth, uh, who's also on our panel. We'll speak with Callie Fell, um, a nurse from San Francisco, uh, who will talk to us about visitor policies and mental health. Uh, Mara Podvi, a colleague of mine from SHIMS, will offer the OT perspective on maternal fetal health. And finally, we'll have Dr. Mark Sewell uh, from the DC area. Uh, Dr. Sewell is a physician. Um, he'll offer for us the physician perspective, especially on universal testing, PPE usage, and screening recommendations. Uh, Dr. Sewell is kind enough to join us while on service, so he'll be stepping out and hopping on the call uh, shortly. Uh, then we'll have some time for question and answer. So uh, with not much further ado, um, we'll move to discuss um, these questions with our first panelist. Uh, our first panelist is Judith Lothian. Um, Judy, do I have you on the line? Uh, okay, I'm unmuted now. I'm here. W wonderful. Thanks. Uh, welcome, Thanks, Judith. So, uh, uh, Judith Lothian, uh, PhD RNFAAN, is the graduate chair uh, in Seton Hall's College of Nursing, uh, where she is a professor. Um, she's an expert in this area and has been very helpful in conversations uh, that I've had with her over the past two years. So, Judy, any perspectives you could offer as we think through challenging issues associated with women and babies would be most helpful. Yes, thanks very much, Brian. Um, if you put me in front of a podium, it's very hard to get me off it in five minutes. So, I have written out what I want to say. So, if it sounds a little stilted, 
um, your questions can get me thinking for, uh, more about this. Anyway, almost overnight in the midst of the tidal wave of confirmed cases, hospitalizations, and ICU, ICU admissions, maternity hospital policies changed. Initially, hospitals across the country restricted all visitors, including families and doulas, in spite of the fact that, and this becomes key, continuous emotional and physical support improves outcomes, including decreasing the risk of cesarean. Mothers were separated from their babies in spite of the fact that keeping mothers and babies together improves outcomes, physiologic stability for mother and baby, decreasing postpartum hemorrhage and increasing breastfeeding success. Everyone, including the laboring woman, wore masks, and it's hard to imagine doing the hard work of labor with a mask. The rationale, of course, was a rapid fire de attempt to decrease the risk of healthcare providers and women and babies contracting the virus. The unintended consequences, however, of these restrictions, I don't think were carefully considered. A hue and cry went up related to restriction of support people not only from families, women and their families, but from nurses, doulas, midwives, and childbirth educators, and at least one state governor, the New York state governor. In the midst of the shutdowns and the social distancing, government leaders somehow realized that women laboring and giving birth alone was just not right. State by state issued orders that women should be allowed one, but only one support person in labor. A, a restriction that weeks earlier would have seemed excessive, but now was happily applauded by women and the Center of Disease Control, ACOG, and the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine issued statements supporting limiting labor support to one person, but insisting on at least one person supporting women in labor. In spite of this, women were still fearful um, being alone or having to choose between a husband or doula are not their only fears. They worry about going into a hospital, as Brian pointed out, largely caring for very sick people, where almost all units were, and many continue to be, almost completely COVID-19 units. How do you feel safe when you're hearing codes called in adjoining units, where the nurse spends as little time as possible in your room? There began to be increasing concern about mothers being routinely separated from their babies and discharged well before breastfeeding was well established or well before there was an opportunity to meet with a lactation consultant. Social distancing, once home brings its own set of worries, women are now going home with even less day-to-day -day support than is typical in the United States. Women's fears are real, and it's reasonable to think that during the pandemic, women's increased fear related to being in the hospital, um, the loss of labor support from doulas and nurses, and healthcare providers' desire to move women quickly through labor and moving out of the hospital quickly might very well and probably will result in an increase in inductions of labor, speeding labor up with augmentation, and an increase in the cesarean rate. And we know the risks of all of those things. We know that keeping mothers and babies together, especially skin to skin and with strong support increases breastfeeding support. And breastfeeding is more important than ever now to protect babies. Will we see fewer breastfeeding babies at three and six months? Will we see an increase in the already too high incidence of postpartum depression and post-traumatic stress related to birth? These are all possible probable unintended consequences of introducing changes that disrupt the ability to provide safe evidence-based care to mothers and babies. The lens through which we might see this issue at this point in time, and of course this can change rapidly, what we know pregnant women are actually at a low, in a low risk category, mostly because of age. Um, although pregnant women do get COVID, um, we know that there, at this point in time, there's no evidence of the virus in amniotic fluid or breast milk, yet we are still bringing women into hospitals that are largely COVID units. Although in New York City, some hospitals have moved maternity to hospitals treating fewer, pa fewer of these patients and in a couple of instances into hotels. Um, the eth there's an ethical issue, I think, in abandoning practices that may birth safer for mothers and babies, excellent support, letting labor start and continue on its own and keeping mother and baby together. So in light of what we've been dealing with, what are the lessons we can learn from this experience or the big takeaways? 
It's not a surprise that right from the start, women across the U.S. began to question the need to go to the hospital to give birth. Women continue to question whether the hospital is the safest place to give birth. And there is a tremendous increase in women reaching out to birthing centers and midwives who attend planned home births. What women are learning is that planned home birth outside the hospital is actually a safe option for healthy women. The Cochrane Review, <clears throat> which all of you are probably familiar with, the review of planned home versus planned home birth and or planned hospital versus planned home birth determined that for healthy women attended by experienced midwives with the avail availability of medical backup if transfer to hospital is needed, there is no advantage of hospital birth over home birth. And a very recent publication, January 2020, Birth Settings in America, Outcomes, Quality, Access, and the Choice, and Choice, um, put out by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, um, used to be the um, IOM. It's an excellent resource for digging into the issue of out-of-hospital births. And interestingly, in one of my qualitative studies of women's experience of planned home birth, being safe was the most important determinant influencing women's decision to have a planned home birth. And that was well before this pandemic. Because midwives attend almost all birthing center and home births, there's also an increased awareness of having, of having a midwife. The Lancet series on midwifery in 2014 provides a myriad uh, evidence of a myriad of positive outcomes of midwifery care, including lower maternal and infant mortality, fewer interventions, increased childbirth satisfaction, and improved breastfeeding. A key component of midwifery care is the relationship that develops between the woman and her midwife. Amazingly, it's a very positive outcome of this pandemic. States have lifted, although temporarily, restrictions that limit scope of practice for midwives and adverse advanced nurse practitioners. Um, the Institute of Medicine report The Future of Nursing in 2011 took a strong stand that nurses and midwives be able to practice to the fullest extent of their education and training. It would be a great step forward for women and babies and for all of us if state restrictions on scope of practice were abolished permanently. Um, has the pandemic pushed us in the direction of a paradigm shift? Will we finally have a maternity model of care that respects and values women's desire, women's choices to safely give birth out of hospital, either at home or in birthing centers? Will midwives finally be able to practice to the full extent of their education and training? Will midwives finally be integrated into the maternity care system? Uh, we know the experience of birth profoundly is profoundly important for women and their babies with long as well as short-term consequences. Is the hospital, is it time for us to rethink where birth for healthy women takes place? Is the hospital the best place with or without a pandemic? Hospitals have always been for those who are sick, not just in times of pandemic. I think this pandemic should force us to take the birth setting issue seriously. And I believe there actually is in ethical mandate to do so. Thanks. Judy, thank you very much. Um, I have a host of questions. I mean, there are some broad policy proposals on there. There's some wonderful nuance in the perspective you're offering, but I'm gonna hold those questions until the end um, so we can get to our other panelists. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Thanks. Our next panelist uh, is Catherine Hahn, who's a second year medical student at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine at Seton Hall University. Uh, Catherine, do I have you on the line? Yes. Hi, Dr. Pilkington. Hey, Catherine. Good to talk to you. Please, could you share with um, me and with uh, our audience some of the research you've been doing on maternal fetal health? Yes. So first, thank you, Dr. Pilkington, for having me. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, as Dr. Pilkington mentioned, I'm a second-year medical student at the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine at Seton Hall. When we were first hearing about the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the second year medical students were in the middle of their clinical rotations um, at various Hackensack Meridian hospitals throughout New Jersey. And for our own safety and for the preservation of PPE, all of the students were pulled out of clerkships. Many of the students are now currently doing what they can from home to help the clinicians who are currently on the front lines treating COVID patients. So I'm part of a group of eight students who are currently conducting research on best practice guidelines for COVID. And if you tuned into the ethics session last week, 
you heard some of the other students in the group do a great job discussing what research they have done so far. As students, we receive questions from the clinical teams at the hospitals, and we do our best to search through all of the available data and write short reports that the clinicians can refer to to help give them a sense of what is currently known about the virus in terms of infection control, pathophysiology, and treatment. A lot of these clinicians are spending long hours treating patients, and they do not have as much time available as we do to sift through all the data. So we hope that our summary reports help provide them the information that's currently available. So the reports I've written so far have been on topics in maternal health along with pediatrics. And when I first started my research, one of the most pressing questions was if the COVID-19 virus could spread from mother to baby, either in utero through vertical transmission or via breast milk. Right now, there's still a lot unknown about the transmission of the virus. And what we do know is based off of limited um, case reports and analyses that have been published in the literature. So one of the studies that's been cited a lot in the literature is a meta-analysis of 37 pregnant women in China who had confirmed COVID infection. All of the infants from these mothers tested negative for the virus via throat swab. And in addition, all of the samples of umbilical cord blood, amniotic fluid, and breast milk also tested negative. Um, however, they did discuss one case of infant death from shock and multi-organ failure but it's unknown if this was due to effects from the virus, especially since that particular infant tested negative. It was a similar study that was published out of New York Presbyterian looking at 18 pregnant women with COVID. And many of these women were actually asymptomatic and they tested positive after universal screening measures were implemented. 17 out of 18 of these newborns tested negative for the infection. There was one infant who had indeterminate test results, but he remained asymptomatic and was presumed to be negative. So again, right now there's still a lot of unknown, but it appears that the risk of transmission from mother to baby is unlikely. However, even if vertical transmission is not possible, there's still the possibility of other obstetric complications. Um, in particular, there have been case reports of women with COVID-19 having preterm births but at this point, it's still not clear whether or not this was due to the virus. There have been some cases of neonates with COVID-19, and there was one study that discussed three infants with COVID who were born to moms positive for the infection, but it's unknown if they acquired the infection through transmission from the mother to baby in utero, or if this was from respiratory droplet transmission after birth. And again, in all of these cases, all the amniotic fluid, the umbilical cord blood, and the breast milk samples were negative for the virus. So again, it seems unlikely that vertical, uh, vertical transmission um, happened in these cases, but it still cannot be ruled out. So some of the ethical implications of all of this includes how do we safely protect both the mother and the baby, and what infection control precautions need to be taken which I'm sure some of the other callers with firsthand experience on the front line can speak to. Um, so for example, even though it currently does not appear that the virus can be transmitted via breast milk, the babies are still at risk of contracting the virus from their moms via respiratory droplets during the close contact that's required for breastfeeding. But there's a lot of really well-known benefits of breastfeeding. Um, in particular, breast milk is considered the best source of nutrition for infants. Um, and it's also an important source of early bonding between the mother and the baby. So with breastfeeding, it's important to weigh the risk of infection versus the benefits of the nutrition and the bonding between the mother and the baby. So every patient scenario should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And based on available data that uh, shows that there's currently no evidence of the virus being transmitted through breast milk, the CDC is currently recommending that mothers with confirmed infection breastfeed. And so mothers with confirmed infection who are healthy enough to breastfeed, they should proper, follow proper um, hand hygiene protocols, clean the breast pump before and after breastfeeding, and then wear a face mask during breastfeeding. Um, moms can also consider expressing their milk and having someone who's not sick feed the infant. Um, in particular, if the mother's in isolation and if she feels healthy enough to um, express breast milk, then it's important that she do so in order to sustain her milk production. So those are the main takeaways from the research I've done so far, and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions at the end. 
Um, thank you to all the frontline healthcare workers for all their sacrifices and thanks again for having me. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for your research on this. Um, and also for um, taking your best intentions to assist in this effort and doing so in a safe way. So uh, we're all very appreciative of that. Uh, I know there are going to be a lot of questions, but just like with Professor Lothian, we'll save those till the end. Uh, for our audience, we're now going to jump across the country and speak uh, with another nurse, Callie Fell. Callie Fell, MS, BSN, RN, is a perinatal nurse at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center. Uh, she is also a fellow in the Paul Ramsey Institute. And on a personal note, I am grateful for the work of the Paul Ramsey Institute and conversations that I've had with uh, their fellows and scholars. Uh, so Callie, do I have you on the line? Hello, yes, can you hear me? Excellent, and just a quick clarification, everyone, with apologies to Callie for my typo. Uh, it says Katie Fell, this is in fact Callie Fell. So welcome <laughs> Callie, sorry about that. Um, and please share your experiences from California with us. For sure, no problem. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak on this panel today. And um, thanks so much for continuing to have these important discussions. Um, so when I was first approached about participating on this panel, I started to ask my colleagues that I work with, I work with about 200 other nurses, um, what ethical challenges they were facing. And it seemed like two main themes seemed to emerge. And Judy touched on these briefly, and I'm gonna go into them a little bit more detail, but quickly. Um, so the two topics were um, one about visitor policies and restrictions and another on maternal mental health. And so those are the two topics that I'm gonna focus on during my short time with you today. Um, so first, as far as visitor policies and restrictions, um, in the Bay Area, there are differences among facilities concerning visitor policies. Um, in the hospital where I work, we're allowing one support person for the duration of the mother's stay. This support person is allowed to leave and return if they wish. Um, however, from what I understand, in neighboring hospitals, once the support person has entered the hospital, they're, they're not allowed to leave or risk not being able to return. Um, before entering the hospital each time, the support person must pass, pass a screening questionnaire. If the patient happens or, or mother happens to be COVID positive and their support person has been living with the patient or has had unprotected contact with the patient, then most likely they aren't going to pass the hospital screening and will not be allowed to accompany the patient or mother for what could be the birth of their own child. Um, the mother may choose an alternative support person um, but you can see how this could get complicated quite quickly, uh, especially among patients with family out of town. We have a lot of transplants in the Bay Area or um, families that have other small children. And then also perhaps the patients no longer, no longer has a uh, supportive relationship with the father of the baby, but feels that, that he should be there for the birth. So these are all, all considerations around visitor policy. Um, doulas are permitted if the patient chooses them as their one support person. Um, this is disproportionately affecting populations such as Latina communities and African American women who are already vulnerable to poor outcomes. Uh, one organization I was actually talking with a friend yesterday from Sister Web. Um, it's an organization that works with hospitals in our area to provide doula services for at-risk populations. And their services, unfortunately, for the large part are on pause. Um, and they're trying to support their mothers virtually, but of course this has its own challenges. Um, in San Francisco, also I'd like to point out that we have women who come from or who come to the hospital as surrogate mothers who are carrying other other uh, who are carrying a baby that to, for an attended parent um, as part of it as an international or domestic surrogacy arrangement. So there are issues around this that have to be considered for the surrogate mother, the intended parents, and of course the infant. Uh, first, intended parents residing in other countries or states might be prohibited from even traveling to California. Um, in these instances, who is responsible for making decisions about care or, or caring for that infant? Second, visitor policies must be addressed. Certainly the surrogate mother should have her own support person for the birth, but what about intended parents? COVID-19 has definitely exposed the delicate nature of surrogate contracts and brings to light many unanswered questions about the process of surrogacy, especially as it pertains to international surrogacy. Um, so now with the rest of my time, I'd like to switch gears to um, mental health concerns. 
Um, according to the ACOG, 80% of postpartum patients will experience some form of baby blues. Of that 80%, 20% will go on to experience depression. Um, it's been shown that reducing social isolation during and after pregnancy through culturally and linguistically relevant prenatal support group care, peer-led support groups, or home visiting programs has improved maternal mental health conditions. But as we all know, due to the COVID outbreak, these support group meetings, pregnancy centering groups, and breastfeeding support groups are limited or canceled, and new mothers are physically isolated from the support of their friends and family. Um, of course, some support groups are still able to meet via teleconferencing, but again, this has its own challenges. Uh, for example, many marginalized populations don't have access to computers, to the internet, smartphones. Um, and then some of my colleagues have seen challenges with the interpretation services being provided to patients who need them once they're home. Um, Judy touched on this, but like many hospitals, we're discharging eligible patients earlier from the hospital to decrease exposure risk. Um, and it's become imperative for nurses to ensure that we're educating patients on the warning signs of postpartum depression as well as other complications. And we're getting shorter time to teach what I believe is more important or ever, ever, ever more pressing. Um, so there's concern, you know, that we're discharging women who have an elevated risk for developing um, mental health disorders into a community with limited support. So um, we, as far as I know, at our hospital have implemented postpartum check up phone calls, but um, from what I understand, these are on a volunteer basis. So we really need to be asking what we can do to better support our postpartum mothers as they transition to motherhood, especially without their physical community. And we need to make sure that we're checking in with our mothers often enough and asking them directly about their mental health. Um, and then lastly, I know I'm trying to uh, finish on time here, but um, you know, this does extend, I'm a perinatal nurse, so I see from antepartum, so patients who are with us for a long time, all the way through till where they're discharged um, home after, after delivery. And some of our antepartum patients are with us for months before being delivered or, or being discharged, and they already have um, pre-existing mental health conditions. So, um, you know, care from our social workers has been limited to telehealth and our grant funded activities to provide enrichment for these patients have been halted. So there's also worries about their psychological and social health of these women's as well, as women as well. So I'll leave it at that. And I really appreciate you guys um, having, having me on this panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, uh, for offering your perspective um, and for the wide array of information you shared. We appreciate it very much. Um, especially thanks for highlighting vulnerable populations and some of the effects which um, impact them more greatly than others. Uh, I may have to pick your brain a bit more as that's a topic of one of our future sessions. As with our other panelists, uh, we already have questions coming in, but we're going to save all those questions uh, for everyone to the end. And for members of our audience, please do continue to send questions in. Uh, all right, so now uh, we're turning to my colleague from SHIMS, Mara Podvi, PhD, OTR, MPHC, who's an associate professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy in the School of Health and Medical Sciences at Seton Hall University. Uh, Mara, do I have you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Brian, for having me. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we're very excited um, from, from what I've learned. Occupational therapists are getting into maternal fetal health in a deeper way, and this is more of a new trend, um, but you can correct me on that if I'm wrong. So please, uh, any, um, anything you can share with our audience as we think through these issues would be most welcome. Sure, so uh, first I wanted to talk a little bit about, about what occupational therapy is for those of you who don't know. So occupational therapy is a health science profession that really focuses on engagement in daily life activities, or as we call them, occupations. Um, in terms of uh, maternal, fetal health, postpartum health, um, we tend to deal with the issues that are not necessarily medical issues, but are daily life issues. Um, as OTs, we're trained in physical, psychosocial, and cognitive domains across the lifespan. And so um, we can work with mothers, we can work with babies and do, and work with uh, fathers and, and other um, family members that help uh, pregnant postpartum women and babies. Um, we as OTs specialize in developing new skills 
new roles, um, supporting uh, habits, routines, and what we call co-occupations, which are activities that we do together. When women are pregnant and have babies, they do a lot of co-occupations. Those are things together with their baby, like breastfeeding, like um, diaper changing, like caring for the baby at home. So the occupational therapy approach is really to work with what happens outside of the hospital, what happens um, while we're preparing to give birth, what happens after we come home. Um, we address individual group and population care for supporting role and skill development, um, provide psychoeducation for uh, new parents and expectant parents, uh, a lot of normalization of the pregnancy and postpartum experiences, provide referrals when necessary to medical professionals, provide screening for potential issues that may occur, uh, pro, uh, teach energy conservation and work simplification techniques to make life easier for the body as it is um, furthering along in pregnancy and as it is recovering from delivery, as well as problem solving daily life challenges that come along. Um, now, some of the psychological effects and physical effects are, are um, things that I'll, I'll be discussing. Some of the psychological effects have already been discussed by, by the other esteemed panelists. Um, I wanted to point out a little bit about uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, these are the number one pregnancy complication. Um, gestational diabetes is routinely tested for during pregnancy. Only about six to eight percent of women experience gestational diabetes, but um, as uh, Callie mentioned before, 20 percent of uh, women experience a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder during or after pregnancy. Those include um, depression, anxiety, as well as OCD, postpartum, some uh, about um, a, a very small percentage, about four percent of women may experience postpartum psychosis. Um, hopefully, uh, we're having more awareness about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and they're being screened more universally by both OBGYNs and pediatricians, especially during the COVID era because postpartum follow-up is not necessarily as um, comprehensive in terms of uh, women being able to go in, uh, pro uh, providers being able to look and read the body language of women who are coming in and not necessarily even having the time to ask all of these questions. We really encourage pediatricians to also be um, screening mothers for this disorder since they see uh, mothers so much more frequently than um, their own uh, OBGYNs or midwives do following um, birth. Um, Long-term effects of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders for mother and baby um, include attachment uh, disorders um, and can be affected by the constant elevated cortisol level that women are experiencing during this time of stress. Um, a lot of the uh, prenatal um, and uh, pre-delivery stress that women are experiencing and, and grief that they're experiencing from the, the loss of their um, planned pregnancy, planned birth, um, can in part lead to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, there's been uh, some literature showing that uh, women's expectations versus their experience uh, put them at risk for developing uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, we have a, a kind of a toxic culture around pregnancy in uh, Western countries at this point. We do a lot of telling women of what they should do or what they must do. And women um, are getting uh, messages, differing messages from all around what they should or must be doing to keep their baby healthy. Women become hypervigilant at trying to do all the right things for themselves and for their babies for fear of being seen as a bad mother. But when these messages are contradictory, it's impossible um, to meet the expectations. Um, a lot of hospitals are asking women to make difficult choices in the moment such as we've already discussed, who is going to support you during this delivery? And that can be incredibly stressful um, and can lead to, um, uh, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> <coughs> 
can lead towards uh, a, a, a um, traumatic experience in terms of birth. Um, in uh, the general population, approximately four women experience traumatic births, um, but a lot of uh, NICU parents, parents whose uh, babies end up going to the NICU right after delivery, around 40% of those um, tend to experience um, PTSD uh, symptoms. Birth trauma, which is um, certainly less uh, intense than PTSD, is experienced with uh, one third of, of mothers in a typical time period. This is not a typical time period, so we can certainly expect to see a rise in both birth trauma and PTSD in parents. And that's something that we're going to have to be prepared to deal with afterwards, um, after the COVID era, era is over. Another thing that I wanted to mention quickly before we're done is that the physical effects of pregnancy and postpartum are things that are also going to need to be taken care of. Wound care for C-sections, episiotomy, and perinatal trauma is something that needs to be addressed in women um, because they are going to need to care for themselves when they go home and they are going to need specific training on how to care for themselves considering these particular birth injuries. Um, postpartum uh, pelvic complications, pelvic organ prolapse, urinary and fetal incontinence, diastasis rectus abdominis, um, difficulty uh, with toileting, general perennial pain, incision pain. These are things that women experience. And we kind of joke that moms pee when they sneeze and laugh and cough. Um, we're going to need to deal with those problems that women experience um, uh, after they give birth. And we have to prepare moms to know that these are normal things that occur. Our prenatal education may or may not include some of these uh, issues, but they're incredibly common. Women don't know. And when they go home with no support, as we've discussed already, that can be very challenging. Um, I think that uh, also teaching pregnant women as much as possible before the baby comes, how to uh, transi transition into their new role as parents is going to be very important for them. Uh, letting them know what challenges to expect with parenthood and not just focus on pregnancy and childbirth. Um, I've got so much more to say, but uh, hopefully some of the questions will uh, lean towards how do we support mothers when they go home with their babies um, after birth in this COVID era. Thank you, Mara. Uh, we really appreciate your perspective um, and bringing the OT view to this. Uh, we're going to now move uh, to our final uh, panelist, Dr. Mark Sewell. Um, who's a high-risk OB and also a retired lieutenant colonel uh, from the U.S. Army. He's been stationed in Afghanistan, in Germany. He's a maternal fetal doc, um, currently at Inova Alexandria Hospital, uh, and he's also a clinical associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So I think we can say go Tar Heels. Uh, Mark, do I have you on the line? Yeah, Brian, can you hear me? Okay. Yep, you're coming in great. Thanks so much for hopping out of clinical service and joining us. We really appreciate it. So uh, we had chatted briefly about um, your take on universal testing, PPE usage, screening recs, anything you could share with us from your perspective on those topics or what anyone else has addressed would be most welcome. Got it. Yeah, some great talks that I, I heard, caught the back end of there. Uh, real quickly for the, for the group here, I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist, so we deal with pregnancies that are high risk for whatever reason. And as you could imagine, uh, pregnant women with COVID fit that category. Um, just a little bit of background with these type of viruses in pregnancy. Back in 2009, the H1N1 outbreak brought severe complications for pregnant women. Uh, pregnant women who, who did get H1N1 had a four to five times risk of severe maternal morbidity and a much higher risk of mortality. So when we heard about the new outbreak of COVID earlier this year uh, in China, the early data looked like it were pregnant, women, pregnant women were at low risk, um, which seemed to be good. Um, we then looked at when the New York City outbreak happened and looked at the numbers from Columbia. And what they noted there, which is the most concerning for us, is that about 13 to 15% of pregnant women who presented to their labor and delivery were asymptomatic yet positive. And so that adds a new layer of concern as to what this means. A couple of their patients at Columbia actually had severe complications after they delivered in the postpartum period. And that group of patients is what concerns a lot of us the most is that when they come in asymptomatic and become very sick, how do you handle those patients? 
And so when I spoke with Brian, we talked about different issues when it came to the medical care and safe care of these patients and the safety of the uh, staff, nurses, doctors that are taking care of these patients. The first thing I think that came to mind when we discussed this was the issues with PPE. And most, if not all hospitals have some severe limitation in PPE. Um, and it has taken a good deal of effort, both administratively and otherwise to get PPE available to nurses and doctors so they can closely take care of these pregnant women who are coming in. It makes it a much bigger issue if we don't know which patients have COVID and which patients don't have COVID. So it switched from being a PPE issue to a universal testing issue. And that's where I think most places are now around the country is that we're trying to make sure we can test patients who come into labor and delivery to see if they have COVID or not. And so there's all sorts of different tests that are available. There's the PCR-based test that takes about 24 hours. There's a rapid test that can come back in between 30 minutes to three hours as well. Um, and so that's where most places are. My labor and delivery right now, we are offering universal testing to all patients who've come in. I'm located in the, the DC metropolitan area in Alexandria. And we've found a prevalence that's pretty low much lower than New York in the 13 to 15%. We're in the two to 4% range um, when it comes to the prevalence of patients coming in. But what's important to know is that we, with those patients that are asymptomatic that we test positive, it allows us to treat the patient safely and differently to make sure we stay away from medications that could cause problems, or we also can um, watch them more closely postpartum and also make sure the baby is closely watched as well and tested if necessary. Um, it also allows us to limit use of PPE to, um, for those patients, meaning um, at one point with PPE, when we were looking to deliver mothers without any testing, it was mandated to use the N95 mask and complete donning and doffing of gown and glove and mask, et cetera. Um, in all patients, now that we know which patients do and don't have COVID for the most part, we can save our PPE for the patients who we know have COVID and don't have it. Um, one other thing I wanted to add was, is that I am a member of a perinatal collaborative in the state of Virginia, and we have discussed best practices around. The biggest black box that we have, and I think Katie referred to this before, is that we don't have a lot of large trials. There are no randomized clinical trials. We're dealing with uh, cases or, or case series of 30, 40, 50 patients where we don't know what it means for all pregnant women. We don't know what it means for pregnant women who have comorbidities such as hypertension or gestational diabetes or diabetes, obesity. All those things make the risk of COVID much more concerning. And we're going to have to see how those things play out for women who have COVID. Um, on the perinatal collaborative last week, we had Dina Goffman on the, on, the, on the Zoom call, and she is the senior author of the Columbia study, which looked at the prevalence of asymptomatic patients. And she gave us some best practices regarding different medications to use and not use. And it was a very interesting talk because as you all know, that the prevalence of, of the COVID in, in New York City is higher than anywhere else in the country, if not possibly the world right now. And it allowed us to, to figure out how this would affect pregnant women differently. Um, and I'm free to take any other questions that anybody has. Uh, and, if, and Brian, thank you for including me in this uh, discussion today. Um, it's, it's, I'm glad to be here. Mark, thanks so much for joining us, and especially since you're uh, currently on service. We have had a couple questions come through, and I'd like to direct the first one um, to you. And for those who um, are still uh, still have more questions, send them in through the chat feature, or please tweet them at us. Um, at ShoeBioethics is our Twitter handle. So uh, a couple of the questions that have come in, uh, Mark, and the first one for you is uh, one of our medical students, uh, Linda Dion, who's on the line, has um, heard a lot about uh, third trimester issues or considerations associated with COVID, but was wondering, one, if there's any research on the infection for first and second trimester babies, um, and also any best practice recommendations or any um, anything you could offer for um, women who are in the first or second trimester? So that's a good question. And so I've looked at this in ACOG and SMFM for women who had early infections. We don't, it doesn't seem to be there's any um, 
fetal risk of, of teratogenicity or birth defects associated with first trimester exposure. I had a patient today actually who had pneumonia unexplained the last week of February and we did her anatomy ultrasound and everything was fine. And I, I think there's nothing we have yet. Um, we don't know if there's, we pray there's nothing like Zika out there that's gonna affect babies in the same way as a viral infection can sometimes do. So I think our best practice right now is that, you know, we, we worry about maternal issues in the first and second trimester, and we will determine if we think there's any increased risk with the virus exposure to the developing fetus. We have not seen anything in the early data that's out there, and we'll continue to monitor that. Excellent, thank you. I wanna open uh, up the question to our other panelists. Um, if there is, is anyone else on the line who has anything to add to what Dr. Sewell offered, uh, please jump in now, otherwise we'll move to our next question. I can add a little bit about um, some of the research that I've seen. Um, so obviously this is really an area of a lot of unknown for um, first and second trimester and the data available is a lot more um, limited compared to third trimester data in women who have given birth. Um, but right now, one of the concerns in particular for um, first and second trimester women is the concern of miscarriage, which is something that I'm currently looking into. Um, and we know that previous coronavirus infections like SARS were associated with a slightly increased risk of miscarriage. But it's really difficult because, because this is based off of really small samples in the literature. So one paper that I saw was a sample of 21 women with SARS and out of these 21, eight patients suffered miscarriage, but um, it's difficult because miscarriage is unfortunately a pretty common phenomenon that not a lot of people talk about. And still at this point, there's not much information known about miscarriage and COVID. Um, and even if a woman is positive for the virus and suffers a miscarriage, it could be due to a wide variety of causes, um, not necessarily from the virus itself. So we really need large scale epidemiologic studies to see if, first of all, if there's any kind of association and if there's any kind of increased risk, because at this point we still really don't know. Um, and then if there is an association to see if there's any kind of causality. Um, so right now I haven't found any published data of miscarriage in association with COVID. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it hasn't happened yet just because it hasn't been published. So this, again, it's still an area of a lot of unknown and an area where a lot more research is needed. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, that's most helpful. And I know uh, Dr. Joseph, if he's listening in, will be very happy um, that you've referenced the importance of epidemiology. So um, thanks for the explanation and uh, for pointing us in that direction. Uh, we've had another sort of very practical question um, from one of our professors in nursing, Benet Ramsey, who I think has multiple degrees from Seton Hall, which lets me respond to my Go Tar Heels with a Go Pirates. Uh, so uh, Professor um, Benet Johnson uh, had asked the very practical question of whether um, insurance companies are covering home births. So I'd like to direct this to Professor Lothian. Um, if you know, wonderful. If not, we'll see if anyone else on the panel um, is able to speak to this. Judy, do I have you on the line? Yes, I had to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, yes, insurance good. insurance companies do indeed cover, not every insurance company, but almost all of them now cover home births. And again, um, I'm not sure it came out in, in my discussion, but um, again, you know, when we're talking about out-of-hospital birth, we're talking about out-of-hospital birth for healthy women with no underlying medical conditions and, um, and no complications that have developed during pregnancy. And um, that actually, in spite of all of our talk of risks, um, that is actually the vast majority of women giving birth. That's it. Thank you, Judy. Um, any other comments from our panelists on this question? Or we're, um, if not, we're gonna move to our next one. We have quite a few questions. So this is, um, well, and all these questions are most welcome. Excellent. So we've had some questions um, coming in um, asking about particular reflections and best practices on the NICU um, from a few folks. So this may be uh, for Callie or anyone who could uh, on the panel who could comment. Um, anything in particular best practices associated with NICU um, as opposed to other maternal fetal practices?
So um, as far as I, I am, don't work in the NICU, um, I'm only familiar with um, our visitor policy right now in the NICU and I'm only familiar in, in my hospital. So I, I'm not sure that I can speak much to that other than um, currently um, in our NICU, as far as visitor policies, if a baby is admitted, the parents um, can can see the baby on a rotational basis, one parent at a time for a 24 hour period. Um, so if dad goes and see, starts seeing the baby around 9 a.m., he has until 9 a.m. the next day to see the baby and then it's mother's turn. Um, whether or not that's best practice, I think um, we need to investigate that more. But again, I can't speak much to that as um, I'm, in a different department. Excellent. Thank you, Kelly. Actually, and the question was specifically, which I should have highlighted for you, about visitation policy. So that was exactly what the question I was looking for. Um, since Kelly's based in California, anyone um, of our panelists from the East Coast notice any differences relative to the NICU visitation? And I'll also add on to that because um, we've just had another question come in um, from another SHIMS prof, uh, Professor George, who was asking about um, the possibility of grandparent visitation um, in the future. So anything else anyone could add from our other panelists on visitation, especially on the East Coast, would be most helpful. Um, I actually spoke with somebody who's working in a NICU in uh, Philadelphia just yesterday, and she said that at her hospital, parents are able to come into the NICU once a day. If they leave, they can't come in again that day, but they're welcome to come in. Um, but they have to stay all day if they want to stay with their baby um, for more than an hour or so at a time. Excellent. Thank you, Mara. All right, so the, the next question um, I'm going to direct to Dr. Sewell and then open it up. Anyone else who wants to uh, jump in, of course, is, is welcome after that. Um, we had received uh, prior to the session uh, notes from um, pregnant mothers with sort of uh, general anxiety and concerns about what's going on during COVID. Uh, so Mark, I was wondering, um, it, just to speak to our audience, any recommendations, any sort of advice uh, or comments that you might be able to share, uh, either from a medical or more humanistic side, um, with folks who are looking forward to delivering in the next few weeks or months, um, and just concerned about what they might be facing? That's a good question, Brian. It, it, it's a it's a very unique setting. I've had a couple of patients tell me this is the worst time ever to deliver a baby. And, and I, I can't disagree with them because of all the concerns there are um, with going to places like a hospital. Um, I see a high risk pregnant population. So even there's a higher level of anxiety, I think among that group as well. Um, and I think that trying to utilize your resources that are out there is the, is the best thing to try to deal with the anxiety that's brought up in this scenario. Um, a lot of different areas have set up telehealth to effectively be able to do therapy, you know, visually over Zoom or talk therapy. And I think that's the biggest boom that has happened that has helped a lot of our patients. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I hope that a lot of other places have moved to that model because what that does is it effectively allows them to have therapy from their home and it makes it a better scenario. Um, what's, what's been unusual on my end is that I, I, I do a high risk, I run a high risk clinic here and we have patients that come in for testing. And what I've noticed is that the patients are much more, I don't know if I'd use the phrase happy, but th the fact that we are giving them news where the baby is doing well is, has met with much more relief now, which I can detect from our patients. It's, it's a unique scenario um, and, and trying my side being the provider what I'm trying to do is, pr is promote that sense of positivity because I think that there's so much out there right now that they are being told is an issue. There's the COVID, there's the problem with the pregnancy. There's so many things that are negative and that from a provider standpoint, trying to work our way through that is the biggest concern from, for nurses and doctors. And then you add in the effect of possibly having you know exposure to COVID, not having a, a partner or spouse at the delivery, possibly having a baby in the NICU they can't see, they tend to pile up. And, and that's where I think that we try to try to reassure and be reassuring in our in our communications with them, with them is the biggest issue. 
I wanted to just digress for one second too. To I, I couldn't catch her name, but the medical student who spoke before about miscarriage information that's out there. There is one study or one uh, case series that's been out of China that was published last week in the New England Journal, which looked at 118 women, and they found that three of nine had had first trimester miscarriages. So it's about it's a little bit higher than baseline risk, but that's the first study I've seen that's looked at miscarriage in early pregnancy. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I was, uh, well, so the medical student uh, who's doing this wonderful research is uh, Catherine Hahn. Catherine Hahn, uh, okay. So, uh, so Catherine, thanks for that work, and uh, it's good to have Dr. Sewell on to update us on some more recent studies. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, um, but what I want to say to all of uh, our members of the audience, um, sorry that we didn't get to all the questions or get to hear all the panel's reactions. I suspect Professor Lothian had a good deal to say in response to the last question. Um, for those of you who are interested, we have a discussion board where you can add follow-up questions, and we can get those questions to our expert panelists um, who are all continuing this work, and we'd be happy to make connections um, and to get you the answers to the questions that you have. Also, thanks again to everyone who wrote in asking for this topic. Um, we're happy and very grateful that we were able to get um, so many experts from such diverse backgrounds on, on the panel today. Um, thanks very much uh, to all those panelists in particular, uh, and everyone would be clapping, but since I've asked them to mute their <laughs> mics and videos, you guys won't hear that right now. Uh, I'd also encourage you to please follow on Instagram at Hall Students and also at Shu Bioethics. Please follow um, our bioethics work uh, at Shu Bioethics also on Twitter. I'd like to direct everyone, if you're interested, uh, one of our medical students has been engaged in advocacy, sort of political advocacy, trying to get um, appropriate information out there to everyone and also um, to illustrate the importance of PPE. So she's written letters to um, our current president as well as other political leaders. Um, and regardless of uh, what side of the aisle you fall on, um, I think it's really important to have clear and accurate health and medical information out there for everyone. So please feel free to join us on Monday at five o'clock. Uh, the information's up here now um, for some camaraderie and for a letter writing session. Uh, also, thanks to everyone um, who called in because I know it's quite a busy time. And uh, please tune in next week uh, and we'll look forward to speaking with you then. Uh, Thanks, everyone, and uh, be safe.